welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Tonight we're getting into the word. I believe that God has a message for you and I and that we're going to leave this place encouraged and blessed and glad that we came. We're going to leave this place saying we heard from the voice of God tonight. So, you know, you didn't come to hear from me. Oh, thank goodness, because listen, I don't have anything to say. You didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. It's about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So tonight, if you would, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you've already done in this church service. God, it's just awesome to be in your presence. Lord, thank you for healing individuals. Thank you for blessing marriages already, God, business owners, God. Lord, we want to go further. We want to go deeper with you, God. I know, Father God, that you have a word for each and every individual in this room, God. Lord, we thank you, Father, that as we open your word tonight, God, that you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, receiving it with meekness, God. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we thank you, Lord, as we put our intention as our interest in, God, and do our part that you'll do your part, God. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the guidance, the correction, and even the discipline that we need, Lord. We ask you for it as a good father. Lord, we thank you that tonight that you give us your word, breaking that bread open for us that we can live by. God, we give you praise and glory and honor for that. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. In no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, God. So tonight, God, we ask that you would bless our Baptist brothers, Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest and uh, Oak Valley, God. We thank you, Lord, for Inland Christian, God, now the well, God. And we thank you for the way world outreach, God. We just bless all of our Catholic and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. Anybody that's preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray that you bless them this night as you bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say... Amen. Come on, you guys need to say a better amen than that. There you are. Praise the Lord. Get your Bibles out tonight and go with me to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Tonight I have a subject called The Cry of a Sinking Man. Matthew chapter 14, very familiar story out of the Word of God. And in fact, uh, many messages have been preached on on the section of Scripture that we're going to tonight. We're going to find out some principles from the Word of God about the cry of a sinking man. Matthew chapter 14... Here we pick up a story It's taking place. Jesus has sent his disciples on ahead of him, and he has stayed back to pray. The disciples are straining against the oars. There's a great swell and a great storm that's come up. And here Jesus comes in the midst of this storm, and he's walking by, and one section of Scripture says he's, he's about ready to pass him up. And the disciples see Jesus walking on the water. They cry out for fear. They think that it's a ghost. And, and you've heard this story probably before. Here Jesus says, hey, it's, it's me, guys. Don't be afraid. And so now Peter, big mouth Peter, comes out, right? And Peter says, well, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out onto the water. Jesus says one word. He says, come. Here Peter steps out of the boat and starts to walk on the water, starts to walk towards Jesus, the only other man in history that we have recorded that walked on water. What an amazing miracle is taking place. What amazing triumph, what an amazing thing that's going on that Peter is walking on water towards Jesus. My goodness, this is miraculous. But what happens here, Peter is, and he starts to see the wind, he starts to see the waves, and he gets his eyes off of Jesus, and as he does, we pick up the story. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse number 30. Take a look at it with me. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 30. It says, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Remember, the title of tonight's message is The Cry of a Sinking Man. Here Peter is walking on water in the midst of a miracle, and he starts to sink, and he cries out three little words, Lord, save me. Verse number 31. I love the first two words of verse number 31. Look at this. And immediately. Everybody say immediately. immediately. See, that's the kind of God we have. 
When it's the right time, God is there immediately. God is not late. God is not forgotten. God is not, uh, you know, lazy or any of that kind of stuff. God is a God of the miraculous. God is a God of the right timing. God is even a God of the immediately. Even if it may not be our time, I'm sure Peter would have liked to have had Jesus there before he was sinking. Hello. I know in my personal life, I never want to sink. And yet when I am sinking and I cry out to the Lord, there's these two words, and immediately... Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I don't believe that that's a stern rebuke from Jesus, even though we know in our faith many times we've started to doubt, we've started to sink, and we've heard those words and felt condemned. My goodness, why can't I believe God? Here I was in the midst of a miracle. Here I was doing something great for the Lord, and I began to sink. Well, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is realigning his, his faith. He's getting him back to a point. Why did you doubt? You were already in the midst of a miracle. You were already doing something great. Why'd you doubt? See, Peter, when he stepped out of that boat, the wind was already boisterous. Peter, when he stepped out of that boat, the waves were already swelling and going past him. And so he got his eyes off of Jesus. There's many lessons that could be drawn from this that, you know, keep your eyes, keep your focus on Jesus. Stay strong in the Lord. Don't doubt. Keep the faith. But tonight I want to take a look at a couple of things about prayer that we can draw from this cry of a sinking man. What we learn from Peter's cry, a couple of quick things tonight that I believe we learn from the cry of a sinking man. Here Peter is in the midst of his miracle. Here he is doing something great. Here he is doing something that no one else did. You know, we could get down on Peter for for his doubt. We could get down on Peter that he sank. But listen, no one else stepped out of that boat. Hello? No one else walked on water. No one else told the Lord, command me to come, and the Lord commanded him to come. My goodness, this was a great thing that he did. But we learned some things from Peter's cry. First thing for tonight that we learned, what we learned from Peter's cry, number one is that sinking time is praying time. Amen. <laughs> See, we, we, we can get so hard on ourselves sometimes, and, and I don't know about you, but I know I often will do this. You know, hard times hit, and you, all of a sudden you're hitting your knees in prayer. And then you start to beat yourself up. You say, well, you know what, God, why does it take this to get me to pray? Why does it take hard times? But listen, you know, those other times, those are still praying times. Every other time. In fact, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. That means always keep an open communication with God. So in the midst of good times, that's a praying time too. But sinking time is praying time. So don't let the devil beat you up and tell you you're subpar Christian or that you're bad or wrong because when you start to sink, you start to pray. No, that should be the response of every Christian. Adversity should run us to the arms of our Lord, to the arms of the Father, to the safety in his wings that the Bible describes. Why? Because that's what God is there for. God has got our back like we sang tonight, that he goes before us, that he is our front and our rear guard. He is our shield and our buckler. God is going to take care of us. God is going to watch over us. God is going to protect us. The angel of the Lord encamps about those that fear him. And so when we start to sink, when we realize in the midst of our miracle, in the midst of something great, and when we realize that we're sinking, that's time for praying. Are you listening tonight? See, we should be driven to the Lord's presence. Even though Peter's cry was late, it was not too late. See, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter how long it's been. Maybe, maybe you, you haven't been like Peter. Maybe you've, maybe you've neglected prayers. But listen, your late cry is not too late. If you haven't yet cried out to the Lord, it's time tonight, church, to take a moment and cry out to God and pray to God and say, God, I know I've been neglecting. God, I know I've been slack. God, I'm sinking here. And Lord, I need you to save me. I need you to help. And the Bible says those two words and immediately, and immediately. See, God responds. And, and listen, sometimes it takes time. I get that. We see that in the book of Daniel here. Daniel is fasting and praying for 21 days. My goodness, I'm sure when when he started to pray, he wished he didn't have to go through all that to get to the answers. But you know what happens when he has an angel appears to him, and, and what happens is the angel says, the moment you started to pray, the answer was sent. And immediately. Now, earth time, our time here, it may seem like it's taken forever. You know, come on, God. Couldn't you have done this last week? Couldn't you have done this last month? Couldn't you have done this last year? God, I'm sitting here waiting. God, it's taking some time. But listen, it's all on his time. It's not on our time. 
times of pain and anguish, we find ourselves driven to prayer. Was it, wasn't it a sinking time in Jonah's life when he started to pray? Think about that. Here he is in the belly of a whale. Here he is thinking that it's all over. Here he is in utter darkness, starting to be digested by a great fish. Three days he's in the belly of a whale, and finally he prays. And after he prays, what happens? He gets spit out on the shores of Nineveh, right? Back on track. Back on the purpose and the plan and the will of God. See, in our lives, we need to be wise enough to realize, listen, tonight, if you're in a dark place, if you're in the belly of the whale, if you're sinking, it's time to cry out to the Lord. Even though your cry may be late, it's not too late. Can you say amen? amen. Keep your, uh, actually, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. If you come on Sunday mornings, you should just be able to drop your Bible open to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We were in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, like a year or two ago. Hebrews 4, great verse. If you haven't marked this in your Bible, note this verse. It's a, it's a great verse, a verse where you should go often. A verse that you should put to memory. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 16, look at this. Let us. Everybody say, let us. Yeah. See, this is a choice. We can choose to do this or we can choose not to do this. But the right choice is let us do something. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, I want you to notice up on the overhead, I've got a couple of highlights there. First one is come boldly. What does that mean? That means come like you mean it. That means come open, come honest, come real, come raw. Peter's prayer was not an eloquent prayer. Peter's prayer was three words, Lord, save me. Now, sometimes we say, well, I don't want to be a selfish person and only pray for myself. But listen, when you're sinking, you need to pray for yourself. Hello? It's not a time to, to start having that false humility. Oh, I can't pray for myself or my needs. No, you need to cry out to God. You need to bring that up to the Lord. And sometimes people say, well, I don't know how to pray. I can't pray. You know, I hear you pray on the, in the front. I hear people praying at the front here after church. And I can't pray like that. Listen, God doesn't want you to pray like that. God wants you to pray like you. And the way that you would talk to somebody is the way that you would talk to God, only add your reverence and your fear of the Lord. Realize that you're approaching the king, but listen, you have entrance. You've been given access. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ allows you to come in. He is now your heavenly father, and now you can come boldly. You can come openly. You can come frankly to the Lord. You know, if you're, if you're confused and maybe a little bit angry, that's okay to express that to God. In other words, you can shout to God, you can talk to God, you can cry to God, you can mumble to God, you can weep to God. However you can get it to God, get it to Him. Just come and bring it to God. God knows your heart anyways. God already sees it anyways. And if you're afraid and say, well, I don't want to be mad at God. You know, God didn't do anything wrong, but I'm still mad at Him. Listen, God knows your heart. He already sees it. So you can be all open and honest with Him and say, God, I'm really angry. And honestly, God, right now, the feeling is, is that I'm angry at you. I know that's wrong, but God, it's still there. Help me, Lord. Lord, save me. Just bring it up real and raw. I love, uh, there was a, a movie a while back, uh, Robert Duvall, I think. Here he was up in the upstairs of his mom's room, and he's just screaming. And the neighbors come over and knock on the door. Will you tell him to be quiet? And he, What's he doing up there? And he says, well, he's praying. He's praying, yeah. Sometimes he talks, and sometimes he shouts. But listen, we need to come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy. God's merciful. God, God sees, God knows, and, and God understands our hearts and our lives, and therefore he offers us mercy to approach the throne of grace. Even though we're not worthy, he extends the mercy of Jesus Christ that now he has made us acceptable, he has made us worthy to approach, and we can find what? Grace. Grace, God's ability. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. And find help in a time of need, in a sinking time, if you will. If you're sinking tonight, it's time to cry out. No situation is too desperate. No situation is too drastic for our God. God specializes in desperate, drastic 
situations. Can you say amen? amen? What do we learn from Peter's cry? First thing we learn is that sinking time is praying time. Second thing we learn is that small prayers are big enough. Small prayers are still big enough. Three little words that Peter cried out. Notice Peter didn't stop and recite our Father who art in heaven. You know, he didn't go through the whole thing. He had three little words, Lord, save me. Now, there will be times in your life where you have time to really get in there in prayer and spend some time with the Lord, spend a, a, a half hour with God, spend an hour with God, spend an evening with God, spend an overnight prayer time with God for some of you guys. I, I mean, I know there's some people that can get down in prayer, and, and my goodness, they, they can just connect with God. And, and, and for those of us that aren't necessarily that guy or that gal, you know, we kind of feel bad about that. Well, I should be spending more time in prayer. But listen, remember, pray without ceasing. Keep that constant communication open with God. Always keep it on. You know, just like you ever heard of a butt call? <laughs> you have. I can tell by how you're laughing. If you don't know what a butt call is, that's when somebody's got their phone in their butt pocket and it calls you. And you hear everything, right? You know if they're walking. Zip, 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 right? You know when they're talking. You know what they're talking about. You can hear. You, you, you know, man, they're at the mall because I can hear somebody there at the cash register. They just ordered a hot dog on a stick and a large lemonade, right? And, and you hear it all. Listen, we need to keep open communication with God. You need to call God and never hang up the phone. I had a friend in high school that, that said that he never said amen after his morning prayers because he never wanted to shut it off. He never wanted to tell himself that this is done. He wanted to keep the communication open. So at the morning prayers, he would say, Lord, bless my day. Bless what I'm going to do. Give me the mind of Christ, God, and I thank you for this day, Lord. And then he would go on his day. Never hung up the phone, just kept it on all the time. Made sure that he kept that open communication with God. But small prayers are big enough. If you don't have time to sit and to pray and to go through everything, man, throw up the quick prayers. We see this all throughout the word. People who just uttered quick prayers, who just, they were about ready to go into a situation and all of a sudden they were in prayer with God. I think of Nehemiah. Here's Nehemiah in a sinking time in his life. Here's Nehemiah. He's just gotten a report and it was a bad report. He heard about Jerusalem, the city that he loved, the city of his God, the city of his people. All that it represented, and the walls were torn down. The people were decimated. And here he hears his report, and he sinks down, and he's just depressed. He's in a slump, sat, and here he's about ready to go before the king. And so he has some times where he does pray a long prayer. But then when he's in the presence of the king, you read in the first chapter of Nehemiah that the king sees a sad face on his wine bearer, Right? That was not a good thing because if the wine bearer had a sad face, that meant something was wrong. And if he was still giving him his wine sad, that probably meant that the king was going to die. So the king could have at that moment sent Nehemiah to be killed for whatever conspiracy he thought was going to happen. They would have poured out the wine and he would not have drank it. So here Nehemiah is sad in the presence of the king. The king says, what is going on? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And we read in the word that Nehemiah just inside, threw up a quick prayer. God, give me favor. We're not sure of the words really that he said, but it was just quick enough that before he answered the king, he talked to God. Wow. God gave him tremendous favor. In fact, that's, God gave him so much favor that he had letters, he had supplies, he had everything he needed to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Peter's three-word prayer was heard and immediately acted on. Prayer is not about length, but it's about strength. Let me say that again. Prayer is not about length, but about strength. Love this quote from John Bunyan. The best prayers have often more groans than words. Better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. D.L. Moody, my goodness, I love this quote. Some men's prayers need to be cut short at both ends and set on fire in the middle. <laughs> Hello. God is not interested in a lot of words. God is interested in the desire of your heart and the passion that's pouring out of you. And we have a definition for spirit-filled prayer. Prayer in the spirit. It's faith-filled, focused prayer 
in the Spirit of God. That you get in there and you are filled with faith and you are focused and you are passionate, you are on fire, and now all of a sudden you are pouring that out before your God. And if you don't have words, then have groans, have cries, have tears, pray in the Spirit, pray in your understanding, pray in your prayer language, whatever you got, you just give that to God. If all you can say is, Jesus! then just give that prayer to God. God hears your heart. God knows what to do and will immediately act on it. You're there in Hebrews. Turn back with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus speaks on this matter in Matthew chapter 6. Take a look at it with me. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 7 and verse number 8. Jesus is speaking on prayer. He's revolutionizing everybody's thinking. He's tearing down all the strongholds and, and saying things that they never thought possible. Things just turning their, their understanding upside down. Here he starts to talk about prayer. And the Jews had daily prayers. They had prayers. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem today, when I was there, you could see them there. And they still had the, the, the scriptures on their hand and on their forehead. And they would recite the prayers. And they would go back and forth. And they would speak all these words. And they would say all of these phrases. And they would repeat them over and 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 over. I think you get the picture. And over again. And so Jesus starts to speak to these people that have this culture and have this mindset. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 7, verse number 8. And he says, and when you pray, what are we talking about tonight? The cry of a sinking man. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Notice he didn't say as the synagogue leaders or as the church leaders. No, as the heathen do. In other words, we should not look like the rest of the world when it comes to our prayer time with God. It doesn't have to be about long repetitions or oratories or uh, pontificating. That's not what this is about. God is not impressed by your eloquence. God created language, knows words we don't even know, knows the true meaning and understanding behind them. So our pontificating and our eloquence before the Lord is nothing. Don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. In other words, you're not going to be heard for your many words. Verse number eight, therefore do not be like them for your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. Amen. Now that's not an excuse not to pray. That just tells you you're off the hook. You don't have to spend hours praying about something. Get in there with faith. Get in there with what you need to with God. Pray about it and watch God move in your life. My goodness. One of, uh, one of my instructors when we were in Bible college told a story of how he went into a hospital to pray for somebody and there they were in the sick bed and uh, he just put his hand on this guy in the sick bed there and he, and he just said in the name of Jesus and the guy popped up straight out of bed and started praising the Lord scared the guy that was praying just I mean just he jumped out of his skin like <laughs> you know and but listen all he had to do was get in there and pray. He had faith. He believed God. He spoke the name of Jesus. And that was all it took. Immediately the Lord raised him up. It's not about our length, but about the strength of our prayers. God hears our hearts. God knows our needs. And God responds in turn. Are you listening tonight? Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight. Number three. Number three. And I like this one. Extreme situations are God opportunities. Extreme situations are God opportunities. Now, I know that if you're not a thrill seeker, maybe you don't like this one that much because we don't really like to be stretched. We want to be comfortable. We want to be, uh, you know, we want to be patty cake sometimes. We want to be pampered. And we don't want to hurt. We don't want to go through the extreme situations. But listen, how many of the other disciples' names were marked in the annals of history that they walked on water? None. Only Peter has that reputation. Why? Because he stepped out into an extreme situation. And it was the fact that he stepped out in faith and had the boldness and the courage to say, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. And here Jesus has said, I want you to come. And he stepped out of the boat. And there he walked on water. Now, he was the only one that we know of that did that. Maybe other men and women throughout the ages have done that. I don't know. But listen, these ones are recorded in the Bible. So I can know for certain that these two men, Jesus and Peter, and Jesus is the God man, so I can kind of understand that one. But here's Peter walking on water on the word of the Lord. 
That means that in our lives, we've said, Jesus, command me to come. Jesus, I, I, I want to be a Christian. Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow your example. I want to follow in your footsteps. And Jesus says, come on. Come, you can go to heaven. Come, you can live this Christian life. Come, you can do this. And we're going to follow Jesus. But listen, it's not always easy. It's not always on dry land. It's not always on stability. It's not always on the solid ground. Sometimes you're going to have to step out of the boat. Sometimes you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. Sometimes you're going to have to get into an uncomfortable situation that's getting a little crazy, a little boisterous, a little windy, a, a little wavy. See, and there's going to be things that take place. Well, listen, in the midst of your miracle, if you find yourself sinking, cry out to the Lord. Why? Because extreme situations are God opportunities. God was going to get glory from this. God was going to be praised because of this. God was going to receive worship because of this. You know what happens? Jesus grabs Peter. Why did you doubt? They get back in the boat. Immediately, the storm, the wind, and the waves are gone. I picture the sea like glass. There they are at the other side, and all of the disciples are amazed at him. Bow down and worship and say, truly, you are the Son of God. See, Jesus had a purpose. Jesus was revealing himself, revealing his authority, revealing that he was the Son of God on the earth, that he had command over the elements, command over the wind, over the waves, that there was no situation too strong for him. He's proving himself Lord over all. Here his disciples give him glory. And now we read the story. Why? Because it's a good history lesson? Because we can be amazed? No, because God is still God. God still has authority. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he can command that then, if he can save Peter then, how much more can he do in our lives now? Come on, church. Greater works he said we would do. We got to start stepping out. We got to believe God. We got to go after supernatural that confirms the word of God. We've got to go for it with God and believe God. Because extreme situations are God opportunities. Never before in history has been, there been such a time as this when Christians on the face of the earth have the opportunity to preach the gospel, to reach the world, to travel, to tell, to go after non-Christians, to believe God, to do miracles, signs, wonders, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know why there's greater works? Because there's more Jesus running around. He's on the inside of each and every one of you. You've got God on the inside of you. It's no longer one Jesus. Now, there's a whole bunch of Christians, little Christ, running around on the earth. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're filled with the Spirit, and now you can go out there and you have the authority to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devils, to preach the gospel, to baptize and to disciple. And God is saying, it's an extreme world. It's a crazy world. But listen, this is a God opportunity. Cry out, church. Cry out. Believe me. All through the Bible, we see examples. Daniel in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Extreme situations are God opportunities. Peter in prison, about ready to be killed. The church does what? Pray. My goodness, that is the source of our power. That's the source of our strength. You're there in Matthew. Turn with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we hear the cry of another sinking man. Mark chapter number 9. Another familiar story, but I want to look at it in light of what we've been talking about tonight. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 17. Mark chapter 9, verse number 17. Jesus has just been transfigured on the mount. Here he comes down with his disciples. There's a great commotion happening, great commotion taking place. His disciples are there. There's, there's uh, an argument going on between the Pharisees and the scribes and his disciples. In the midst of all this, there's a demon-possessed child. Here, Jesus walks on the scene, and Jesus isn't going to allow chaos to continue. So Jesus said, what's going on here? Verse number 17, Mark chapter number 9. Verse 17, Mark chapter number 9. And one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Verse 18, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Verse number 19, he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Verse number 20, then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, 
Immediately the spirit convulsed me, fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Verse 21, so he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Now, verse 22, the father continues to speak. Jesus asked him one question. He gave him the answer already, but now the father starts to kind of ramble on. Listen to what he says. Verse 22, and often he's thrown him into both the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, Jesus looked past this man's words and looked into his heart and saw what was going on. There was something that took place right there when that man said, if you can do anything. Listen, he brought him to Jesus. He had heard that Jesus had cast out devils. He had heard that Jesus had healed the sick. He had heard about the signs and the wonders and the miracles. And so he brought his son. He was in a hopeless situation, an extreme situation. This had been going on for a long time, and this was his heart. Any parent knows that when your child is going through something difficult, it's like your heart is ripped out of your chest and sitting right there outside of you. You would do anything to trade with them. You would take their place. You don't want them to hurt. You don't want them to go through anything. And so here he brings his child to Jesus. But he gets the disciples. And he thinks, well, you know, the disciples, these are Jesus' disciples. Maybe they can do something. And so he has hope. But then nothing happens. And now a fight has broken out. Now there's all sorts of chaos going on. And now he's finally here with the master. And that doubt has crept in. And he says, if you could do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Verse 23, Jesus said to him, if. Mr. knows Jesus responds right to the point of his need. He looked right past his words, went right to his heart, and where this man's faith hinged on that if, if you can do anything, Jesus says, if you can believe, you can have faith. Look at what he says, all things are possible to him who believes. So he says, if I can do anything? Oh, no, 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 no. It's not about if I can do anything. It's about if you can believe. The Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. So that means that doubt and unbelief is displeasing. So you can almost feel Jesus coming at this guy in a loving way saying, listen, I'm not pleased with this. This is not going to happen. If you want your child here healed, you need to get in faith. So it's not about if I can do anything. I know I can do anything. I'm God. I can take care of this situation. It's not about me at this point. It's about you at this point. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Verse 24, look at this. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. My goodness, what did he do? He acknowledged that it was there and he confessed who Jesus is. He didn't just say teacher anymore. Remember, the first time he approached me, he said teacher. Now he's no longer teacher. He realizes that Jesus called him out, looked into his heart and saw what was going on. And now he does not say teacher. He says, Lord, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. In other words, here's another three little word prayer. Help my unbelief. Give me grace in this area. I need this healing for my son, but I'm not gonna get it in the place that I'm at. So Lord, help me, save me. I'm sinking here, God. Lift me up. Now take a look at what happens. Next verse. He just cried out, help me in my unbelief. Verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Verse 26, then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. Verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. Just like Jesus grabbed Peter, lifted him up out of the water from sinking. Here he grabs this child that was convulsed and thought dead. He grabs him by the hand, and he lifts him up, and he arose. Verse 28, when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? See, the disciples were used to being able to cast out demons. They'd been given that authority by Jesus. One of the gospel accounts, Jesus tells them, because of your unbelief, But in all of the accounts, he goes on to say this, verse 29, so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, sometimes we we get off and we get onto this whole uh, 
I, I would guess, demonology type thing, you know, where we think that, you know, there's different types of spirits and this kind comes out by rebuking, this kind comes out when you ask it its name, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting, this type comes out. Listen, that's the wrong thing, okay? We're getting our, our eyes focused on the wrong thing. In other words, if you're talking to the spirit and nothing's taking place, then maybe you're talking to the wrong spirit. It's time not to speak to the demon. It's time to speak to God. Why? Because you're in the middle of a crazy situation and you're sinking. Nothing's happening. Not time to talk more to the demon. It's time to talk to God. Why? Because God is the source of power and authority and God will reveal to you what needs to take place. God will give you that power. God will give you that authority and at the right time in the right way, God will give you that gift and you will be able to cast it out. That's what this is about. Church, this applies to our lives in every area. Maybe you've been sinking in your marriage. It's time to cry out to the Lord, Lord, save my marriage. Maybe you've been sinking in your finances. It's time to cry out, Lord, save me. Save me. I haven't been able to pay the bills. God, I, I don't know what to do. Maybe you've been sinking with your family and your kids are going south. Time to cry out, Lord, save my children. God, I can't do it anymore. I can't yell enough. I can't discipline enough. I can't do enough. God, you're going to have to take care of them, Lord. I entrust them to your care. Maybe you've been sinking in your personal life and going back to that old stuff, that old sin. Maybe, maybe you're, you're feeling condemned tonight. It's time to cry out, Lord, I'm sinking into the pit again. Lord, save me. Tonight, if you're ready to do that, if you want to cry out to God, just stand to your feet right where you're at. And let's go before the Lord together in prayer tonight. One thing to talk about this, another thing to do it. But if you want to pray tonight, a simple prayer tonight, and you feel like you're sinking and you're in that position, just stand to your feet right where you're at. Don't have to stand, it's okay. But if you feel like you're in that position of sinking, just lift up a hand to the Lord right now. And just say, Lord, save me. Cry out to him, Lord, save me. God, I pray for these that have stood before you. Lord, it's not about the length of our prayers, but the strength, God. It's about the heart. Tonight, Father God, I pray that you move, that we would have an immediately moment, God, knowing that it's okay. God, that you're here, that your hand upholds us. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you move in each and every heart, each and every life in this place, God. We love you, Lord, and we give you praise tonight in Jesus' name. Can we just give the Lord a praise tonight? Come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys before you leave. We'll make sure that your heart is right with God. It would be a tragedy if we came into the house of God tonight, had such a good time like we did, crying in the presence of the Lord and believing God and getting into the Word. I really do believe you guys got something. Thank you for allowing me to speak that into your life. But it'd be a tragedy if we did all that and then we let you go and you walked out of this place, your heart wasn't right with God and you died and went to hell. Listen, I don't want that to happen to you. I know you don't want that to happen to you. God, most of all, doesn't want that to happen to you. Because hell was never intended for us. It was intended for the devil and his angels that rebelled against God. But we can choose with our lives where we go, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Uh, you know, it's not going to affect me because I don't believe in it. But listen, you know the Bible talks about hell. Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus even spoke of hell in the Bible. You can find it all throughout the Bible. It's a very real place. And just by burying your head in the sand and saying you don't believe something exists doesn't mean that you're not going to have to deal with it. So come on tonight, let's talk. Let's make sure that you don't go to hell, but that you end up going to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you know, I, I don't have to worry about hell because all roads lead to heaven. And as long as you stick to your truth, God sees that. And you have your truth, I have my truth. Let's just do our own thing and, and we'll all get there somehow, some way. Listen, you know that nothing could be further from the truth. No one in the Bible just say all roads lead to heaven. It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. It's, it's not going to happen. There's one way you got to get there. You're not going to get there by just driving around on land. You could drive around as much as you want and you'll never make it. So listen, we can't get to heaven your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. Everybody stick to their own truth and that's cool. And God sees that and lets them all in. Listen, God's not a fool. God creates the heavens and the earth, goes to the cross, beaten bloody mess, a spectacle for everyone to see, and then he says, oh, whatever you want to do, just go ahead and do it. Live your life however you want. No. God outlines for us in his word, how do we get to heaven? He shows us 
in his word. Now, sometimes people say, well, I, I understand that because, you know, I know God lets good people into heaven. I've been really good. You know, I used to be bad, cleaned up my act. Now I'm good, done a lot of good deeds. In fact, I've done more good than bad. Therefore, God's going to let me into heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough? Nowhere. Check it out. It's not there in your Bible. Nowhere does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven. Or that because you clean up your act or do more good than bad, that God sees that and lets you into heaven. In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to make it by being good. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags to God. It's going to get thrown out. No one in the Bible say you can be good enough. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. My parents told me they were Christians growing up. Had me christened or baptized as a child, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. Right? Wrong. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible to say be baptized or christened as a child or wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, or be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere do I see in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Come on, tonight, let's love you enough. Let's respect you enough. Let's honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. So he said, well, pastor, I get that. I understand that. But you know what? Uh, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Hey, I'm sitting in church in front of you right now tonight. And doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm sitting in church. And while I'm glad that you came tonight, could, could you just show that to me in the Bible where it says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's like saying you could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, sit in the dugout, call yourself a Dodger. My goodness, you could even bring a uniform, wear a uniform, bring your bat and your ball and think that you're going to get to play in the game. What's going to happen? They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. Why? Because you're not a dodger. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Now, sometimes people say, well, I, I get that. I understand that. But my last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, taught in the Bible classes. We got our membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. Could you, could you just show that to me in the Bible? where that gets you into heaven, where you help out, carry the pastor Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teach in the Bible classes. Get a membership card to that church. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible to say God is looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Now, sometimes people say, ah, got you on this one. It, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus, Easter, the resurrection, sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, from the Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? No. How do I know that? Because if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures. It's recorded in your Bible and my Bible. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. Listen, this is not about what society says or television, Hollywood, movies, books, or t any other thing on the internet. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean throughout the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. Have you given God all of your heart? And have you given God all of your life? If not, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not saved. You're not going to make it. Now, the good news is, is that you don't have to stay that way. You can change destinies tonight. You can give God all of your heart and all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, and bang, pop my hands together just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, just like that, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out, Pastor. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. 
Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now will you do your part, giving God all your heart, all of your life, acknowledging your need for Jesus in this place by simply raising your hand. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up and count it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ended up in hell. Tonight is your night of salvation. Who should raise their hand in a moment? Have you been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You say, lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. A little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. Because Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. So tonight, that's the condition you're in. You know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. You can make a right relationship with God, going hot for Jesus tonight by simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online all over the world, get ready to get your hands up. God sees and God's watching. And then you can click the blue button right afterwards, and Pastor Jim will come and lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Or if you're on campus, raise your hand. You can tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Who else tonight? Five wise people already on this side. Where are you at? Where are you at? Just give me a little wave. They're pointing somewhere over here. Thank you. Got you right up here. Okay, thank you. That's six wise people. Who else tonight? Six wise people. Oh, seven right there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Seven wise people. I already got you guys. Thanks. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Anybody else that I didn't already see? About seven Wise people tonight, giving their hearts and lives to Jesus. Thank you, number eight. Got you, man. Good job. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? There's about eight wise people. If you need to do this, come on. Come on, let's go for God tonight. Who else tonight? Number nine, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, go for it. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Thank you, number nine. Okay, number ten. Come on, you were waiting for that round number. If that's you, number ten, go for it. Come on. God's waiting on you. You know you need to do this. Anybody else? Come on, number 10, where you at? Let's just go for God tonight. If that's you, just pop your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Where you at, number 10? Thank you, number 10. Got you right there. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for 10 wise people tonight. Woo! God is good. All 10 of you, if you're number 11, 12, 13, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late for you either. Here's what I want you to do in a moment. We're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do, Elijah's going to sing a song. That's your cue. Get your stuff. What have you brought with you to church? A purse, a sweater, a Bible, a friend. If you need a friend, hey, come on, get your stuff. Whatever you brought with you to church, get in the aisle. Meet me up front. We're going to change destinies tonight. Now, listen, no one leave during this time. Very rude to try and get people to come this way, and you're going that way. Okay, so we want to encourage everybody that needs to come forward to come forward. And if you have your children in the family room or if you've got them sitting with you, you can bring them. They're welcome here too tonight. We're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So that's you. You raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Let's stand to our feet and welcome them. Come on down. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. And though I'm running to your arms. Come on, come on, come on. I'm running to this your arms. This is your time. The riches of your love This is your moment of salvation always be enough Cause nothing compares To your embrace the You can come to you, this is your time This is your moment of salvation I'm running to your arms Everybody else, if you need to come, you just come right now Make your way to the front Come on, come on, come on. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Will always be enough. Cause nothing compares. All right, you guys up front. Hey, put a smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Listen, if you were still headed for hell, we'd all be bawling and squalling. But listen, you're going to heaven. That's that's awesome. So we can smile about that. We can be happy about that, okay? Now listen. Right over here to my right, your left. 
This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to happen. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me. This is about as weird as you're going to get tonight, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things. Number one thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. A couple of booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading. It's free. All right? Take about a half hour, maybe 45 minutes if you read slow and sit down and read about what to do next. We invest more time in television, books, movies, all that kind of stuff. You can invest that time. Sit down, find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym helps you get strong, make sure that you're doing the right exercises, helps you to eat the right things, you know, and, and make sure that you're accountable to them in order to grow strong and healthy? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Basically, it's a friend in church. We all needed friends when we got saved to help us get strong in the ways of the Lord. So if you're going to succeed in your walk with God, you need a friend. And SPT, spiritual personal trainer, is that friend who will help you come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. One a week, it's easy, it's quick, it's free. You need to do it. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life here at this church consistently coming one, two times, three times, however many times you can come to church a week. We got 11 services, so pick a couple, okay? And after that year, you're going to be so strong and so healthy, staying consistent in the things of God, that you'll be so blessed that you'll say, my goodness, I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. You guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.